uh, to be careful not to discuss any classified matters in open session. If there is uh, an indication that uh, one of those issues uh, uh, has come up, please, uh, uh, the staff will stand up and, and uh, uh, caution us and please suspend the discussion until, until I am, am able to make that precautionary uh, <coughs> note. So with that, uh, let me uh, uh, welcome everyone. This is the, the first uh, of uh, what I envision will be many opportunities to have open hearings. 62 years ago, this very month, in the midst of World War II, President Roosevelt addressed the nation by radio, saying the following, this war must be waged. It is being waged with the greatest and most persistent intensity. Everything we are and have is at stake. Everything that we are and have will be given. Today, America again finds itself in the midst of a war. The threats facing America are difficult and vitally different uh, than the threats we face in World War II. This, this threat is more diffuse and more long-term, and there is danger uh, that it will not be recognized for the defining challenge uh, it may pose to our nation. But make no mistake, everything that we have is again at stake. And the American people deserve to know whether everything we have will also be given. That is the essential question that the House uh, Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence will seek to answer in the 110th Congress. Given the threats to the American national security interests from failed states imploding in violence to terrorist networks plotting attacks to rogue dictators seeking nuclear weapons to rising powers looking to challenge American influence. Is everything we have as a nation being devoted to that fight? What are our threats? And do we have the capabilities we need to protect America? To help answer those questions, we have invited <coughs> the Director of National Intelligence, uh, John uh, Negroponte, as well as the leaders of our major intelligence organizations, General Michael Hayden of the CIA, General Michael Maples of the DIA, uh, and Charlie Allen of the Department of Homeland Security, and finally, Philip Mudd of the National uh, Security Branch at the FBI. These leaders represent the thousands of women and men in the intelligence community, many of whom are serving at this very hour on the front lines. And I want to thank and salute those, pre those brave professionals. And I also want to welcome their leadership to today's hearing. I want to thank Director Negroponte for his service as our nation's first Director of National Intelligence. Though we may not have always agreed on the direction of this new enterprise, we certainly commend you, sir, uh, for your service and wish you well in your new endeavor. Uh, and we also look forward to meeting with and working with the person nominated to replace you, and that is Admiral uh, McConnell. I also want to welcome all the members of the, of the committee. Uh, those who are returning to serve on this committee as well as our new colleagues that will join us. Uh, Mike Thompson of California, Jan Schakowsky of Illinois, uh, Jim Langevin of Rhode Island, and Patrick Murphy of Pennsylvania. I want to particularly welcome our former chairman, uh, good friend and colleague, uh, our distinguished uh, ranking member, uh, Mr. Hoekstra. Uh, so, with that, my colleagues, I want to make the following pledges to you as we begin our first public hearing. I will endeavor to forge a bipartisan approach and will seek common ground where we can. Where there are differences, I pledge to you that we should air them civilly and professionally. <coughs> I will work to promote excellence in the intelligence community to sharpen the tip of the spear in this war on terror so that we can produce the most effective intelligence capability for both war fighters and policymakers. I will focus on oversight and reclaim the power of this committee because the American people expect us to do the job that is required by the Constitution. I will conduct as much business as possible in public because, after all, the public is paying for all of this. But where national security must be safeguarded, we will, we will do our work behind closed doors and maintain the secrets of our nation without compromise. And so, to my colleagues and to the public that we serve, I want to say, we will never question your patriotism for expressing disagreement with one of us or any other official of our government. In the near future, I will issue a formal committee work plan, but for the moment, 
uh, let me share some of my personal priorities for this committee. Our first goal was to implement the 9-11 Commission recommendations. Well, we did so by passing HR1 to close the gaps in our homeland security and by creating a new intelligence oversight panel within the Appropriations Committee. This panel will fuse together the intelligence authorization and appropriations processes. Uh, this is good news for the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence because it is the first time that we'll have a formal seat at the appropriations table, allowing us to contribute the knowledge that we gain from our extensive oversight to decisions on the appropriation of funds. I will work to make certain that this new panel enhances the effectiveness of congressional oversight. Second, I believe that the Congress must send an Intelligence Authorization Act to the President. We have done so every year since this committee was formed in 1978, that is, until the last Congress. Through no fault of this committee, Congress has not enacted authorizing legislation for the last two years. So I want to get us back on track on that. Third, the committee must focus on two primary theaters of conflict right now, Iraq and Afghanistan. And we must understand why we are having such a problem uh, achieving our objectives in those two theaters. In the coming weeks, I intend to hold a series of hearings on Iraq so that we can fairly assess the situation there and evaluate the President's proposed new course of action. I am eager for our witnesses here today to share their views about whether we are making progress in Iraq and whether the proposed plan on the table will likely stop the sectarian violence that is raging around our some 140,000 American forces in Iraq. The committee will also continue the work we began in the last Congress to understand the threats posed by Iran and North Korea, two nations that are bent on obtaining a nuclear arsenal in defiance of the world community. What, what do we know about these two regimes? How are their decisions made? And perhaps most importantly, what is it that we don't know about those two nations? We all know that the Al-Qaeda network has evolved over the past five years. Is Al-Qaeda still the greatest threat to the U.S. homeland? What about Hezbollah, Hamas, or other radical Islamist groups? What about so-called homegrown terrorists? As the terrorist threat evolves, we need to know more about these threats and what we can do to stop them. So I plan to direct our committee to focus also on the areas of the world that have received far less attention in the, in the recent past, such as Latin America and Africa. The threats from these regions often appear less urgent, but both of them demonstrate trends that, if left unaddressed, could seriously threaten core U.S. national security interests. The committee will explore how we can build a better, stronger core of intelligence professionals who speak the languages and have the cultural sensitivity to penetrate and understand the hardest targets. Diversity is not just something with, that we will pursue to make ourselves feel better. Uh, in an intelligence war, it is a matter of national survival. We are going to remain focused on improving analysis by insisting on caveats, dissents, alternative views, and the use of open source material so that we never again allow policy to be based on or justified with flawed or unchallenged analysis. We are going to carefully and systematically review some of the more controversial and sensitive intelligence programs, uh, such as the NSA surveillance program and the CIA's det detainee program. As I noted yesterday, the administration's decision to end the practice of warrantless surveillance and seek court orders from, FI from the FISA court is certainly welcome, uh, if not long overdue. I am going to withhold judgment on this until we can review the court orders and the legal memoranda that were provided to that court. We'll look at these issues in a serious, constructive, and bipartisan fashion. The committee will continue to monitor the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, as well as the, the stand-up of the National Security Branch at the FBI, and also the emerging intelligence tools utilized by the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security. All of these developments uh, are post-9-11 in, in our world today. And of course, we are going to stay true to the reason that this <coughs> committee was created nearly three decades ago, to ensure that the intelligence activities of the United States are an effective, appropriate, and lawful use of taxpayer resources. <coughs> Other nations have crown jewels or diamond mines or vast oil fields. Our most precious 
commodities are the liberties and the constitutional values that bind us as Americans uh, together. It is the job of this committee to provide for the common defense, as Article I of the Constitution makes clear, and also <coughs> defend the Constitution itself when our ideals are threatened. So I look forward to a productive hearing and a productive Congress. Uh, and now I'd like to recognize my good friend, our ranking member, Mr. Holstra, for any opening statement that he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations, and thanks for holding this first hearing of the 110th Congress. I wish to welcome everyone here, especially uh, our good friends at the, the witness table. Uh, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, we welcome back uh, Director of National Intelligence, Ambassador Negroponte, for what appears may be your last formal appearance in front of this committee. Uh, you know, the, uh, before your confirmation as Deputy Secretary of State. Congratulations on uh, this new appointment. Uh, we are going to miss you. Uh, some of us are disappointed that uh, you're leaving so early in your tenure. Uh, we've got a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, as you do, uh, in the stand-up of the uh, ODNI office. Uh, we're committed to its success, as we know uh, you also were consider, uh, uh, committed to its success. Your personal efforts have made a big difference in putting in place the, uh, a framework for what uh, the, the office of the DNI will look like. Uh, for that, we owe you a great deal of uh, gratitude. Thank you very much for your service and, and best wishes in uh, your new uh, position and uh, enjoy your confirmation hearings. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, that's something that, uh, that you're going to look forward to. The, uh, I also want to invite, you know, uh, welcome the other guests uh, that are here, uh, you know, Charlie, uh, Mike, uh, Mr. Maples, uh, Phil, you know, we are, uh, we're thrilled that uh, you're here. We very much appreciate uh, the service and the relationship that, uh, that each of you have uh, built uh, with this committee over the last number of years as if you've served the country and as you've uh, interacted with, uh, with this group. You know, each year this uh, committee starts its work off by getting an understanding as to exactly what the threats are that face, uh, that face America today. It, you know, it, it is the framework for which uh, we begin our work and we begin our discussions and our oversight uh, for the year. Because as we understand the threats, we have a better, uh, we'll have a better idea and an understanding as to exactly what type of framework, what type of capability, what type of resources, and what kind of information uh, that we need as a nation, that we need as policymakers uh, to keep America safe. You know, the, each of your organizations uh, doing its job, each of your organizations working together uh, with the other parts of the intelligence community uh, and working with us as policymakers will enable us to develop the, the strategies and the tactics that, uh, that will keep uh, America safe. We look, uh, we look forward to continuing that, that work. We look forward to continuing to, uh, to work with you, uh, to provide you with the resources and the oversight. Uh, that is essential to make sure that uh, we each have our uh, we each have our voice and our say in the direction uh, that we're going to go for the intelligence community. I'll submit the rest of my statement uh, for the record uh, so that we can get to the testimony of uh, of each of our witnesses. With that, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank, thank you, Pete. I appreciate that. And just uh, uh, as a matter of administrative uh, business, we're going to be in this open hearing. Uh, till noon. At noon, we have to uh, uh, leave and go into closed session. Uh, so I wanted all the members to uh, uh, to know that. Uh, without objection, all the statements for the record from our witnesses will be made part of the official record of this hearing and are available to the members uh, in your briefing books. Uh, the uh, director will be uh, the only uh, person making an opening statement, but all the witnesses will be available to us for any questions that, that we might have. Uh, so with that, uh, Director Negroponte, again, welcome, and we certainly uh, uh, concur with uh, our ranking member that we appreciate uh, all the work that you've done. We, we hate to see you go, but we wish you well in your new endeavor. You're now uh, free to, op to make thank the opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Hoekstra, for your, your kind comments. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with the both of you and other members of the committee uh, during uh, the past uh, almost two years now. Uh, and uh, though I leave this, uh, I will be leaving this position uh, with regret. I think uh, I'll also be able to look back with some satisfaction at what we were able to start up here 
uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, Mr. Hoekstra. Uh, and it's also uh, for a career, someone who started his life as a vice consul in the Foreign Service uh, of the United States of America back in October of 1960, it's obviously a source of, uh, of excitement for me uh, to be uh, moving back to the uh, State Department uh, if confirmed by the Senate uh, as Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for the invitation to offer the intelligence community's assessment of the threats uh, to uh, our nation. The judgments uh, I will offer the committee are based on the efforts of thousands of patriotic, highly skilled professionals, many of whom serve in harm's way. And the United States intelligence community is the best in the world. And I'm pleased to report that it is even better than it was last year as the result of the reforms <laughs> mandated by the President and the Congress. These reforms promote better information sharing, the highest standards of analytic rigor, the most innovative techniques of acquiring information, and a stronger sense of community across our 16 agencies. The nation requires more from our intelligence community than ever before because America confronts a greater diversity of threats and challenges than ever before. This morning, in the interest of brevity, I will address only a few of the threats and challenges, providing more comprehensive assessments in my unclassified and classified statements for the record. My comments will focus on our, uh, first, our efforts to defeat international terrorist organizations, especially Al-Qaeda, which is seeking, seeking to strengthen its global network of relationships with other violent extremists. The challenges Iraq and Afghanistan confront in forging national institutions in the face of intersectarian, insurgent, and terrorist violence. The two states most determined to develop weapons of mass destruction, Iran and North Korea. The shadow that Iran has begun to cast over the Middle East. Turmoil in Africa. Democratization in Latin America. China's economic and military modernization and energy security and the foreign po policy benefits that high prices offer states which are hostile to United States interests. <laughs> Terrorism remains the preeminent threat to the homeland, to our national security interests, and to our allies. In the last year, we've developed a deeper understanding of the enemy we face. Al-Qaeda is the terrorist organization that poses the greatest threat. We have captured or killed numerous senior Al-Qaeda operatives, but Al-Qaeda's core elements are resilient. They continue to plot attacks against our homeland and other targets with the objective of inflicting mass casualties. And they are cultivating stronger oper operational connections and relationships that radiate outward from their leader's secure hideout in Pakistan to affiliates throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe. Use of conventional explosives continues to be the most probable Al-Qaeda attack scenario. Nevertheless, we receive reports indicating that Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups are attempting to acquire chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons or materials. Their objective, as I have said, is to inflict mass casualties. They will employ any means at their disposal to achieve that objective. In addition to Al-Qaeda, its networks and affiliates, I would highlight the terrorist threat from Hezbollah, backed by Iran and Syria. As a result of last summer's hostilities, Hezbollah's self-confidence and hostility towards the United States as a supporter of Israel could cause the group to increase its contingency planning against United States interests. We know from experience that since 9-11, countering terrorism depends on effective international cooperation. Our successes so far against Al-Qaeda and other jihadists and our ability to prevent attacks abroad and at home have been aided considerably by the cooperation of foreign governments, among them Iraq, the UK, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Pakistan, 
Afghanistan, and many others. It is important to note our shared success is not to take credit, but to demonstrate results. The longer we fight this war, the better we get at inflicting serious setbacks to our adversaries. <coughs> For example, in Iraq, we eliminated al-Qaeda in Iraq's <coughs> murderous leader, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Also in Iraq, we have severely damaged Ansar al-Sunnah's leadership and operational capacity. In the United Kingdom, a plot to perpetrate the worst terrorist slaughter of innocent civilians since 9-11 was detected and disrupted. And in Pakistan last April, Abdul Rahman al-Muhajir and Abu Bakr al-Suri, two of al-Qaeda's top bomb makers, were killed. Again, I emphasize that we do not and could not accomplish our counterterrorism mission unilaterally. Our role varies from situation to situation. What does not vary is our requirement for good intelligence and committed partners, which we have in all parts of the world. The two countries where the United States military is engaged in combat, Iraq and Afghanistan, face challenges that are exacerbated by terrorism, but not exclusively attributable to it. In Iraq, sectarian divisions are widening, but the multi-party government of Nouri al-Maliki continues to seek ways to bridge the divisions and restore commitment to a unified country. The effort to create a moderate front of major parties from the country's three major ethno-sectarian groups to back the Prime Minister has underscored moderate's interest in bridging the gaps between Iraq's communities. Iraqi security forces have become more numerous and capable since my last threat briefing. Six division headquarters, 30 brigades, and more than 90 battalions have taken the lead in their operational areas, have battled insurgents on their own, and have stood up the militias stood up to the militias in some cases. Nonetheless, Iraq is at a precarious juncture. The various parties have not yet shown the ability to compromise effectively on the thorny issues of debathification, constitutional reform, federalism, and central versus regional control over hydrocarbon revenues. Provision of essential public services is inadequate Oil, prices, oil output remains below pre-war levels. Hours of electric power <clears throat> have declined and remain far below demand, and inflationary pressures have grown since last year. Increasingly, Iraqis resort to violence. Their conflict over national identity and the distribution of power has eclipsed attacks against the coalition forces as the greatest impediment to Iraq's future as a peaceful, democratic, and unified state. Prospects for increasing stability in Iraq over the next year will depend on several factors. Among them, the extent to which the Iraqi government and political leaders can establish effective national institutions that transcend sectarian or ethnic interests. And within this context, the willingness of Iraqi security forces to pursue extremist elements of all kinds. The extent to which extremists, most notably al-Qaeda in Iraq, can be defeated in their attempts to foment intersectarian struggle between Shia and Sunnis. And the extent to which Iraq's neighbors, especially Iran and Syria, can be persuaded to stop the flow of militants and munitions across their borders. As in Iraq, 2007 will be a pivotal year for Afghanistan. The ability of the Karzai government, NATO, and the United States to arrest the, the resurgence of the Taliban will determine the country's future. At present, the insurgency probably does not directly threaten the government but it is deterring economic development and undermining popular support for President Karzai. Afghan leaders must build central and provincial government capacity and confront pervasive drug cultivation and trafficking. 
Neither task will be easy. The country faces a chronic shortage of resources and of qualified and motivated government officials. The drug trade contributes to endemic corruption at all levels of government and undercuts public confidence. And a dangerous nexus exists between drugs and the, insurg and the insurgents and warlords who derive funds from cultivation and trafficking. After terrorism, the efforts of nation states and non-state actors, including terrorists, to develop and or acquire dangerous weapons and delivery systems constitute the second major threat to the safety of our nation, to our deployed troops, and to our friends and interests abroad. Dual-use technologies circulate easily in our globalized economy. So do the scientific personnel who define and use them. That makes it more difficult for us to track efforts to acquire these widely available components and production technologies and to adapt them to nefarious purposes. Iran and North Korea are the states of most concern to us today because their regimes are pursuing nuclear programs in defiance of United Nations Security Council restrictions. Our assessment is that Tehran is determined to develop nuclear weapons. It is continuing to pursue uranium enrichment and has shown more interest in protracting negotiations than reaching an acceptable diplomatic solution. Iranian nuclear weapons could prompt dangerous and destabilizing counter moves by other states in a volatile region that is critical to the global economy. By pressing forward with its nuclear weapons and missile programs, North Korea also threatens to destabilize a volatile and vital region, a region that has known several great power conflicts over the last century and now comprises some of the world's largest economies. As you know, North Korea flight tested missiles in July and tested a nuclear device in October. Pyongyang has threatened to test its nuclear weapons and missiles again. Indeed, it has already sold ballistic missiles to several Middle Eastern countries. In the Middle East, Iran's influence is rising in ways that go beyond the menace of its nuclear program. The fall of the Taliban and Saddam increased oil revenues, Hamas's electoral victory, and Hezbollah's perceived recent success in fighting against Israel all extend Iran's shadow in the region. This disturbs our Arab allies who are concerned about worsening tensions between Shia and Sunni Islam and face heightened domestic criticism for maintaining their partnerships with Washington. Uh, not to mention, of course, the deep concern about developments in Iran on the part on the part of the State of Israel. Iran's growing influence has coincided with a generational change in Tehran's leadership. Iranian President Ahmadi Najad administration staffed in large part by second-generation hardliners imbued with revolutionary ideology and deeply distrustful of the United States, has stepped up the use of more assertive and offensive tactics to achieve Iran's longstanding goals. Under the Amani Najad government, Iran is enhancing its ability to project its military power, primarily through ballistic missiles and naval power, with the goal of dominating the Gulf region and deterring potential adversaries. Iran seeks a capacity to disrupt the op operations and reinforcement of U.S. forces based in the region, thereby raising the political, financial, and human costs of our presence to the United States and our allies. Tehran views its growing inventory of ballistic missiles as an integral part of its strategy to deter and, if necessary, retaliate against forces in the region, including United States forces. 
Another key element of Iran's national security strategy is its ability to conduct terrorist operations abroad. It believes this <clears throat> capability helps safeguard the regime by deterring United States or Israeli attacks, distracting and weakening Israel, enhancing Iran's regional influence through intimidation, and helping to drive the United States from the region. Lebanese Hezbollah lies at the center of Iran's terrorism strategy. Hezbollah is focused on its agenda in Lebanon and supporting anti-Israeli Palestinian terrorists. But as I indicated earlier, it could decide to conduct attacks against U.S. interests in the event it feels its survival or that of Iran is threatened. Why would it serve Iran in this way? Because Le Lebanese Hezbollah sees itself as Tehran's partner, sharing Tehran's worldview, and relying on Tehran for a substantial part of its annual budget, military equipment, and specialized training. Syria has also strengthened ties with Iran while growing more confident about its regional policies. This is due primarily to what it sees as vindication of its support to Hezbollah <coughs> and Hamas and its perceptions of success in overcoming international attempts to isolate the regime. Damascus has failed to cut off militant infiltration into Iraq and continues to meddle in Lebanon. As a result, Lebanon remains in a politically dangerous situation while Damascus, Hezbollah, and other pro-Syrian groups attempt to topple the government of Prime Minister Signora. In the Palestinian territories, interfactional violence has intensified in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank since the establishment of the Hamas-led Palestinian Authority government in March. Absent success in forming a national unity government, this violence threatens to escalate further. Talks have stalled over disputes about the political platform and control of key cabinet positions. Hamas rejects quartet and Israeli demands for explicit recognition of Israel, renunciation of armed resistance to Israeli occupation, and acceptance of previous PLO and international agreements. The Darfur conflict is the world's fastest growing humanitarian crisis with more than 200,000 people killed, 2 million internally displaced, and another 234,000 refugees in neighboring Chad. Rebel groups continue to fight against the government because the existing peace agreement fails to satisfy their security concerns and their demands for power sharing and compensation. The Sudanese military has been unable to force the rebels to sign the peace accord, and with assistance from local militias, it is attacking civilian villages suspected of harboring rebels. In addition, Chadian and Central African Republic rebel groups have be become entangled in the Darfur crisis. The spillover viol of violence in the past 10 months threatens to destabilize already weak regimes in both countries. The rapid collapse of the Council of Islamic Courts and the arrival of the transitional federal government, the TFG in Mogadishu, has altered the political dynamics of southern Somalia. The TFG faces many of the same obstacles that have kept any single group from establishing a viable government in Somalia since the country collapsed in 1991. Somali society is divided into numerous clans and sub-clans that resist seeing one group rise above the others to win the confidence and support of the population, and to have any chance of restoring order, the TFG will need to be more inclusive and demonstrate effective governance. More turmoil could enable extremists to regain their footing, absent mechanisms to replace the temporary Ethiopian presence with an internationally supported Somali solution. Al-Qaeda remains determined to exploit the turmoil in Somalia. Gradual consolidation of democracy has remained the prevailing tendency in Latin America. Although some commentators have spoken of a lurch to the left in the region, this year's numerous elections point to no dominant ideological trend. 
moderate leftists who promote macroeconomic stability, poverty alleviation, and the building of democratic institutions fared well, as did able right-of-center leaders. At the same time, individuals who are critical of free market economics won the presidency in two of Latin America's poorest countries, Ecuador and Nicaragua. In Venezuela, Chavez reacted to his sweeping victory of December 3rd by promising to deep his self, deepen his self-described Bolivarian revolution and to intensify the struggle against so-called United States imperialism. He is among the most stridently anti-American leaders anywhere in the world and will continue to try to undercut United States influence in Venezuela, in the rest of Latin America, and elsewhere internationally. As he does so, he must confront the fact that in Cuba, his close ally, the transition to a post-Castro regime has now begun. In Mexico, President Felipe Calderon of the ruling National Action Party was inaugurated in on, on December 1st after a razor-thin majority margin of victory over his <coughs> closest opponent, leftist populist Andres Manuel López Obrador of the Party of the Democratic Revolution. The July election illustrated the country's pol polarization along <coughs> socioeconomic lines. The new government has initiated steps to address problems in northern Mexico that affect both Mexican and security, U.S. security concerns including drug smuggling, human trafficking, and associated violence. In 2006, Chinese leaders moved to align Beijing's, Beijing's foreign policy with the needs of domestic development, identifying opportunities to strengthen economic growth, gain access to new sources of energy, and mitigate what they see as potential external threats to social stability. At the same time, China places a priority on positive relations with the United States while strengthening ties to the other major powers, especially the European Union and Russia. <coughs> Chinese leaders continue to emphasize development of friendly relations with the states on China's periphery to assure peaceful borders and to avoid perceived containment by other powers. In the past year, China achieved notable success in improving relations with Japan under its newly elected Prime Minister Abe, and prospects for cross-straits conflict with Taiwan diminished. In addition to establishing strong bilateral ties, Beijing actively engages with many multilateral organizations, including ASEAN. Beijing continues its rapid rate of military modernization initiated in 1999. We assess that China's aspirations for great power status and its security strategy would drive this modernization effort even if the Taiwan problem were resolved. Chinese are developing more capable long-range conventional strike systems and short and medium-range ballistic missiles with terminally guided maneuverable warheads able to attack U.S. carriers and air bases. We have entered a new era in which energy security will become an increasing priority for the United States, the West, and fast-developing major energy consumers like China and India. Oil prices have fallen by more than 25 percent since their peak last July, and spare production capacity has grown to more than 2 million barrels per day. But escalating demand for oil and gas has resulted in windfall profits for some producer nations that are openly hostile to United States interests. Iran and Venezuela fall into this category. Russia, for its part, now sees itself as an energy superpower, a status with broad ramifications that include strong-arm tactics in its relations with neighboring states. Each of the national security challenges I have addressed today is affected by the accelerating technological change and transnational interplay 
that are the hallmarks of 21st century globalization. Globalization is not a threat in and of itself. It has more positive characteristics than negative characteristics. But global, globalization does facilitate terrorist operations. It raises the dangers of WMD proliferation. It stimulates regional reconfigurations of power and influence, especially through competition for energy. And it exposes the United States to mounting counterintelligence challenges. In this maelstrom of change, many nation states are unable to provide good governance and sustain the rule of law within their borders. This enables non-state actors and hostile states to assault these fundamental building blocks of the international order, creating failed states, hijacked states, and ungoverned re regions that endanger the international community and its citizens. More to the point, it also threatens our own national security and support for freedom and democracy, notably in Iraq and Afghanistan, where our troops, <coughs> those of our allies, are helping defend freely elected governments and sovereign people. In the 21st century, the fact is that events anywhere can and often do affect us. This does not mean that all threats and challenges are equally important. At any given point in time, we must pay greater attention to those that are most dangerous. In our national intelligence enterprise, the military, foreign, <coughs> counterintelligence, and domestic dimensions must be seamlessly integrated to provide our policymakers, warfighters, and first responders with the time and the insight that they need to make decisions that will help keep Americans safe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Director, uh, for that opening statement. And uh, uh, the uh, gentlemen that are with you, uh, that will be available for any questions that the committee uh, might have. Uh, perhaps one of, the, uh, one of the important issues, at least from my perspective, Mr. Director, is um, what, uh, what the status is of the National Intelligence Estimate on Iraq, which was uh, originally scheduled to be completed in December. And it occurs to me that that, uh, that should have been completed before uh, the President uh, concluded his review on Iraq policy so that they might have benefited from that NIE uh, in, in uh, uh, a more comprehensive assessment to put forth his change in in uh, uh, strategy as he recommended to Congress. Can you, can you tell us what is the status of the NIE and why it wasn't made available to the President prior to him uh, addressing the country? <clears throat> first, uh, let me, uh, yes, uh, in, in reply to your first question, the, the NIE at the moment is out for coordination throughout the community. In other words, uh, there is a draft that's now being uh, circulated for uh, concur comment and concurrence by the various intelligence agencies. And uh, I uh, estimate that they, it should be completed by, by the end of the month. Uh, I make two other points. Uh, NIEs uh, take time. Uh, they, are, uh, they represent uh, a large amount of effort and uh, usually take uh, uh, months, sometimes as long as six, seven, or eight months to prepare uh, because of, uh, of the enormous amount uh, of, of effort involved. But I, I want to assure you, and this is my third point, Mr. Chairman, that, that the uh, ongoing judgments and assessments of the intelligence community have been um, brought to the attention of the President and other policymakers on a, on a constant basis. In other words, the absence of an NIE this formal document does not mean that a lot of the thinking and the intelligence and the insights and the viewpoints that are reflected by the intelligence community about a country as important to us, as vitally important to us as Iraq, um, are not brought to, to the president or other policies makers' attention on a constant basis. Mm -hmm. Is there, at this point, any, any idea when that will be completed and made the, the end of this, I, I would expect to have it completed the end of this month. 
the end of this month? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Holstra, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, uh, for that testimony, uh, Ambassador Negroponte. The, the question that I have, one of the areas that you have uh, you didn't address, and I'd be interested to get uh, maybe some perspectives from the folks at the table that uh, are, are focused on this issue, is the threat from militant radical Islam in the homegrown version. You know, I've had an opportunity over the last number of years to visit extensively in, in Europe, and it is a, uh, a grave concern by the intelligence organizations, uh, the national police organizations in, in the various European countries, you know, Spain, uh, the UK, the Dutch, uh, they've all been in one form or another been hit by homegrown terrorists. If, if you could, uh, if the panel could maybe explain the, the variations of the face of homegrown terrorism in, in various countries in Europe and the perceived threat or lack of threat from radical Islamists here inside our borders who may be radical but have not at this point in time decided to become militant and how that process may take place. I, I, I think yeah. I can call on several of my colleagues right. on this one, Ms. Uh, Mr. Hoekstra, but just one point I would make about some of the major incidents that have occurred, like the July 7 incident in the UK uh, a year and a half ago, is that while uh, the incidents uh, might be homegrown and the recruitment base, if you will, uh, can often be uh, second generation uh, immigrants who ha have, have a uh, Muslim uh, background, uh, we've always found some kind of linkage back to, uh, uh, for in, in the instance of the UK incident, it was to Pakistan, the fact that they trained in militant camps there and that e even uh, might have been some direction uh, coming from al-Qaeda over there. So sometimes it's hard to sort out the wheat from the chaff here and what is strictly speaking homegrown and what is homegrown but has the added sort of accelerating and guiding imp uh, impact of al-Qaeda itself. But maybe General Hayden and uh, Bill Mudd and perhaps Mr. Allen would like to add something. Yes, sir, uh, Congressman, I, I think as you know, because I know you visited many of these countries, it, it's uneven in terms of the threat in each of our uh, European allies especially. Uh, they each have different historical experiences, different populations, and so on. Generalizations are always dangerous and no one is immune. Right? But I think the American historical experience and an immigrant nation, uh, our experience um, with bringing in various groups and giving them, frankly, more opportunity than they might employ <coughs> elsewhere has helped us immeasurably uh, in this regard. And that doesn't mean we can ignore it. But when I talk to our European partners and they talk to me about their special circumstances, they are not in, in any case mirrored in their totality with regard to our circumstances here in the United States. Uh, and I'll, I'll defer to Charlie and Phil then to talk more specifically about what it's like in the homeland. A couple comments on the homeland piece. I think that uh, we see similarities and differences between what we have in this country and what we have in Europe. Um, I think we are not immune, um, but the differences may help explain why we've seen less of an impact of homegrown extremism in this country than you might have heard about and seen in Europe. A couple thoughts. The first is it's important to remember in the history of the ex extremist movement we're following that what's provided to extremists is not limited to what we've seen in the past, money, training in Afghanistan, radicalization in Afghanistan. What's happened over the past 15 years is the commodity that's most important in some ways is ideas. And what we're seeing, whether it's in Europe or the United States, the commonality we have is people who are using the internet or talking among friends who are part of what I would characterize as a Pepsi Jihad. It's become popular. It's become popular among youth, and we have this phenomenon in the United States. So in the past, we worried about people, and we continue to worry about people who are connected to Al-Qaeda Central because they were trained or funded by Al-Qaeda Central. Now we see in this country, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, in the center of this country, kids who have no contact with Al-Qaeda but who are radicalized by the ideology and who see the images that radicalize them. So that's a commonality with what you see in Europe. There are some differences. 
as was just mentioned, I think we have population differences, population density differences, community differences that are fundamental between this country and Europe. And I would close by echoing what was uh, just said by General Hayden, and that is that this country has an inclusive uh, aspect to it that is critical, I think, to dampening the effect of global extremism. And this is one of the things I would say, frankly, I personally worry about most, that if we start to lose any sense of the fabric, fabric of our culture, the inclusiveness of an immigrant culture, uh, this will hurt us. Uh, it's, I would just like to say, uh, uh, Congressman, that uh, I agree totally with uh, with Phil on this is issue. We've working with the bureau are looking at the at the dynamics of uh, radicalization in this country, and <coughs> I'd like to reinforce everything that he has said. We are a different society. Uh, we do assimilate and absorb in ways that I think are remarkable, having come from Europe prior to Christmas and spending some days there. You don't see the alienation and all the de facto segregation that we see in some places in Europe. Uh, we do have pockets of extremism. I think the internet, uh, the sort of the person-to-person -person reinforcement of radical ideas are here. But uh, we're looking at Homeland Security bottom-up, working with the Bureau, looking at sort of sector by se sector across the country. We've already completed some studies uh, on this, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, to uh, once we have some additional studies come and tell you our views on this. Frequently we see a charismatic leader, and that's what we see in, in Europe frequently, a, a charismatic leader who select people for further education, perhaps overseas, particularly in, into South Asia. But uh, Congressman Rogers told me I had to read While Europe Slept, and I've read that book, and it's, it, it's quite interesting. It has a lot of, a lot of accuracy to it. We're a very different society, and we must continue to be a very different society. I'll yield back. All right. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Hastings, you recognize. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our witnesses. Um, I'd like to echo the sentiments of um, uh, both the chair and the ranking member, uh, Ambassador Negroponte, regarding uh, the exemplary uh, work that you've done in the nearly two years. I especially um, uh, appreciate your liaison. Uh, with those of us on the committee, and um, uh, the um, kind of different approach uh, uh, that you took, and I especially appreciate um, uh, your visits uh, with me uh, to give me more informal uh, uh, views uh, regarding uh, the establishment of ODE and I. Um, I, for one, am a bit pleased that you're returning uh, to diplomacy, not because of this job, but because of the challenges that we are confronted with and the knowledge uh, that you have of those challenges, not because of your work here, uh, but for your work before becoming the Director of National Intelligence, and particularly uh, listening to your comprehensive overview of uh, threats. It, 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 it is clear um, uh, that uh, some hot diplomacy is going to be required uh, to deal with Iran and Syria. And uh, while it may very well be that we try to leverage them until we find a mechanism uh, for serious dialogue, then we are not likely uh, to be able to accomplish very much regarding the multiple problems uh, uh, that they tend to, at this time in our, um, our history, proliferate all around the world. Um, uh, toward that end, uh, there too little time, too many questions. I have an overriding concern about the Western Hemisphere. Um, it doesn't take one much to pick up a newspaper and uh, see uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad um, uh, trepsing uh, all over South America. Um, and those uh, liaisons are liaisons are for reasons that I'm sure are, are vital to the interests of the United States in terms of their uh, negativity. But I want to uh, uh, go to two uh, areas, um, Israel and Palestine and Lebanon. I'd like to know um, uh, 
is Hamas gaining or losing popularity as a result of the power struggles and violent clashes are in Gaza, and what the sources of Hamas's funds are, and what, if anything, is the United States um, and Israel are doing uh, regarding it, and very briefly, regarding uh, Lebanon, um, can you tell us, uh, has Hezbollah uh, rearmed and reestablished itself since the hostilities with Israel last year? And what sort of weaponry training and funds is Hezbollah receiving um, uh, uh, from abroad? Uh, I'll leave uh, those questions. Indeed, I have so many, many, many more. But I ask you, Mr. Director, and if time permits, uh, General Hayden, if you would both uh, reflect on right. uh, what I have said. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you, sir. And I think General Maples might also have uh, an observation with regard to uh, what kind of uh, equipment the, the Hezbollah are getting. But on the question of uh, the popularity of Hamas, uh, clearly they've, they've not been able to deliver the kind of governance that the Palestinian people would wish of them, so that uh, I would certainly doubt that since since they took office that their popularity has increased. But I'm, I'm also reluctant to offer you a judgment as to, to give you a sort of a day-by-day -day barometer of whether they're up or down. There, there is, of course, the problem of the division between them and the Fatah, and I think that until uh, that is resolved somehow, it's it makes it more difficult to have a valid Palestinian interlocutor uh, in the peace uh, process, although that may well go forward uh, nonetheless. On the question of their source, sources of funds, uh, uh, principally the Hamas uh, gets support uh, from uh, Iran. Uh, that, that's my understanding, uh, to, to the tune of uh, maybe uh, as much as, uh, and these are approximations, a couple of hundred million dollars uh, a year. Uh, on the uh, Le Lebanese uh, uh, Hezbollah, um, they, I think that they have uh, licked their wounds from the fighting that occurred last, last summer. I think we, uh, I, I don't think it's been difficult for them to, to get resupplied. And of course, they don't, they don't have to now get resupplied at an accelerated rate uh, as when they were actually in a fighting situation where they were burning up uh, ammunition and, and other supplies. So I think that it's been easier for them uh, to do that, and I, I, I have no doubt that the source of that resupply would be from uh, Iran, Iran and Syria, and, Syria uh, and probably not by aircraft the way we saw during the time of conflict, but over land and the border is porous, and try as one might, it probably is difficult to stop in its entirety. But I think there is one area where Hezbollah certainly doesn't have as visible a presence as it did before, and that's in the southern part of the country along the Israel border where, and I've been there in the last couple of months, and, and their outposts, uh, the, the outposts there don't have the Hezbollah flag flying anymore. There's a more robust uh, UN presence, and for the first time in many, many years, there's also a Lebanese army presence. presence. So. Uh, they're probably not in uh, quite as advantageous a position in the South uh, as they were previously, although I don't doubt there's a lot of political symphony, uh, sympathy for them down there. But maybe, General, the two, my two colleagues would have something to add here. If you can be as brief as possible, General. Sorry, you bet. I, I just add, uh, Congressman, in terms of Hamas popularity, I totally agree with, with the Ambassador. It's, it's a very much a mixed bag right now. But there is a bedrock of support for them because of their history of providing social services right. to much of the West Bank population that has not been provided to them by, by, by any other uh, government uh, or organization. And just an additional note on, on Hezbollah, uh, Nasrallah, the, the head of Hezbollah, uh, is a very focused leader, but he's also a very careful one. And, and I think he understands that uh, after the conflict uh, last summer, he has been in some difficult circumstances. So the ambassador's licking his wounds, reestablishing himself, I think is a very accurate portrayal. And despite the current crisis in the Lebanese government, um, I, I don't think we want to suggest that, that Hezbollah is not without limits and, and cannot be influenced 
uh, because of those limits. Okay. Sure, just one quick comment. Okay. Uh, we do uh, uh, assess that Hezbollah is uh, replenishing its military capabilities, uh, particularly those uh, those stocks that were either used or destroyed during the uh, the conflict. Uh, and uh, as as a part of that, uh, our expectation is that, that uh, long range missile capabilities is probably very high on the list of capabilities that they want to replenish. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, and Mr. Thornberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was particularly struck, I, <coughs> struck, I think, by the concluding section of Director Negroponte's um, uh, opening statement where he talked about events in one part of the world have consequences and implications for us, uh, some of which are, are hard to predict. I think that's a hard concept for us uh, to appreciate the way in which the world is, is, uh, is interconnected these days. I guess I, what I would like to uh, hear um, is you, what y'all would be concerned about if the violence in Iraq continues to escalate and is not contained, um, beyond, other than the consequences within the country of Iraq, uh, what would that mean? What concerns would you have? Understanding nobody can predict the future, but what are the kinds of implications um, that that would generate? Well, th thank you for the question. Mr. Thornberry, I, I think that if you go back to Zarqawi's letter, uh, or Zaw Zawahiri's letter, the, the uh, bin Laden's deputy, when he wrote in July of, uh, of 05, I guess it was, a letter to Zarqawi and, and laid out the strategy, uh, they, clearly they saw uh, Iraq, uh, he saw Iraq as a platform for the expansion of uh, uh, Al Qaeda's activities elsewhere in the world, world, uh, particularly towards establishing this so-called uh, caliphate, and and, uh, and a lot of that, what was in that letter, has been acted out in the last uh, year and a half or so, and they've it, they've worked pretty much according to script. So I I think I the main uh, forecast I would make for you in that eventuality is that Al Qaeda. Uh, would probably uh, secure a base in western Iraq from wh which it would then use or could use and probably would as a platform uh, initially for expanding its activities into uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, uh, and Syria uh, because he mentions in that letter specifically the Levant. Uh, but then, of course, uh, I think uh, Western Europe and, and other parts of the globe would be uh, uh, vulnerable as well, uh, but uh, I'm sure my colleagues have something to add to this. Just, just very brief, <coughs> Congressman. The three things: it, it, if our our work in Iraq is not successful, number one, a living hell for the Iraqi people, as the forces that are now out of control there, the self-sustaining violence continues. Uh, two, spillover into the region, and and spillover here may not may not be the right metaphor because I think what it leads to is others in the region attempting to influence events in, in Iraq. So that makes it uh, even more complicated there. And then I strongly believe that it, it would leave Al-Qaeda with what it is they've said is their goal there, which is the, the foundations of the caliphate and in operational terms for us, a safe haven from which then to plan and conduct attacks against the West. I would add uh, the empowerment of the jihadist movement uh, globally. Uh, the, the view that uh, it was successful uh, in, in Iraq uh, would affect uh, the population, as, uh, as we heard discussed uh, earlier, and there would be many that uh, would, would gather onto that around the world and threaten our national interests as a result. If the um, conflict between Sunni and Shia escalates in Iraq, does that increase the motivation for Sunni nations to develop nuclear weapons? as they see Iran going down that path. In other words, do the two things, the tension in Iraq and this proliferation concern we all have, do they marry up in some way in, in, with events in Iraq? I, I think uh, they're distinct issues in the sense that I believe what motivates concern on the nuclear front is principally Iran's uh, uh, the fact that they uh, are determined to develop a nuclear weapon. But I think you're right to suggest 
that to the extent that Iraq, if if situation deteriorates uh, further there, uh, to the extent that that draws Iran into the uh, Iraq situation, that, I think that that can probably uh, would have the effect of accentuating the, the fears and, and concerns of the countries uh, in the region. So in that sense, I think they are related. Thank you, Mr. Well, thank you, Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to dialogue with this uh, uh, impressive panel uh, at a public hearing. And I want to congratulate the committee for, for doing it this way. I'd like to, uh, uh, Ambassador Negroponte, in your opening uh, statement that we have here, which is quite detailed, and unfortunately I, I had to miss uh, your, your presentation and, and came in late, I'd like to focus on, on Iran right now and, and for you and other members of the panel to give me the benefit of, of your summary of you, you, you refer to an emboldened Iran and Iran's increasing influence in the Middle East and as we see Iraq deteriorate and we see the Shia and the Sunni of course uh, fighting one another. I'd like to hear more your reaction to how much more emboldened have they become in the last year? Uh, how, how have their finances uh, been with regard to su supply lines <coughs> through Hezbollah to the Shia? How organized is, is, is that into Iraq and, and where we currently stand right now and how you view this new threat? I, I, <coughs> we, we thought pretty uh, long and hard about what adjective to we best suited uh, this, a description of the behavior of Iran, and, and we chose, we selected the word emboldened. We, we believe that they've, they've been emboldened in the last couple of years. I think you could perhaps argue that back in 2003, uh, they were more in a defensive uh, posture, uh, but today uh, a combination uh, of factors, I think, have contributed to this emboldened attitude. One is the course of developments uh, Iraq. I think the other clearly is the ad advent of Mr. Uh, Amani uh, Najad. Uh, but today, I think they they are looking at the region on a in a much more assertive kind of way. Uh, as as things have deteriorated in Iraq, Iran has become stronger. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that uh, that Iraq is the causative uh, factor. I, I I I think it's really a combination of factors. I think it's. It's the, the new leadership, which is definitely, you have a, had a generational change in leaders from uh, uh, what was probably somewhat more pragmatic uh, leadership to the uh, sort of hardline conservative leadership of Mr. Amani Najad. Uh, I think it's uh, their nuclear ambitions that, that predate uh, uh, Iraq. So I, I wouldn't uh, try to, I, I wouldn't describe it to, a, a, a single cause. W with respect to Iraq itself, I think it's clear, and uh, it's become clear over the past year or so, that they have been providing, uh, uh, through their intelligence services, uh, lethal uh, assistance to some of the extremist Shia groups uh, in Iraq, uh, which uh, uh, is a factor contributing to the instability in that country. And how have they been doing that? It's mainly through. Uh, providing the technology, material, and training for uh, the use of explosively formed uh, projectiles that have uh, killed uh, both uh, Iraqis and coalition, including United States troops. And where is that training done? Well, we believe some of it has been done in Iran. But I, I, if I could ask my other colleagues to... And I would be interested in the, to the extent that you can talk about it, the, the presence of Iranians in Iraq right now. Um, as recent events have shown, there, there is a substantial Iranian presence in Iraq, and not just diplomatic or commercial, uh, but representatives of the uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps and the Iranian uh, Intelligence Service as well. Um, if, if you step back and, and look at uh, Iranian activity in Iraq, there is a period of time there when, when I personally, and I think many analysts, would, would put a, a, a less hostile face on it than, than we would today, where Iranian objectives seemed to be a, a unitary uh, Iraq, uh, Iraq that was non-threatening to Iran, and Iraq that 
would be dominated by its majority Shia population. Uh, I've come to a much darker interpretation of Iranian uh, actions in the past 12 to 18 months. In addition to those objectives, I, I think there is a clear line of evidence that points out the Iranians want to punish the United States, hurt the United States in Iraq, tie down the United States in Iraq so that our other options uh, in the region uh, against other activities the Iranians might have uh, would be limited, at least from, from their point of view. I'd add one other thing. You talked about the Iranians being emboldened. Uh, I'd make clear mention of, of the victory of their surrogate. Victory is a terrible word, but, but the perceived victory uh, of their surrogate, Hezbollah, uh, in the summer's war uh, with Israel. Further comment by Aaron, No, I, I would agree with the comments that have already been made, and, um, and, and I think we do see Iranian influence on multiple groups uh, in Iraq uh, right now. Some of those are traditional, uh, for instance, with the, uh, the Skiri and the Badr that have been longstanding. Uh, others are, are developing in other parts of the, uh, of the country. Uh, but clearly it is uh, an effort on the part of Iran uh, to develop um, events uh, in Iraq for their own benefit or their own interests, uh, and I'd say that that probably extends regionally as well. General Maples, could you or General Hayden, if, uh, am I out of time? Yes, you're out of time. We'll, we'll have another, another round. round. Thank you. Mr. McHugh. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, Mr. Director, thank you for your service. Good luck in the future. Um, I just got back over the weekend from Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and I, I hope I can get a question on each. I trust that red light is from Mr. Kramer, not me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, during a, a meeting we had with General Casey, he made the assessment that by the end of 2007, this year, uh, he felt all the, Irani, uh, Irani, the Iraqi uh, army could be in charge of various sectors throughout the country in the lead. Uh, in, a, in a meeting we had thereafter with the uh, Prime Minister, I asked him if, if he agreed with that assessment, and he said that's too long. He believed that they could be in charge and fully competent within no more than six months. Uh, I was just wondering if you'd have any comments upon uh, those rather different views as to the Iraqi capabilities within the next year. Well, I, I, to me, speaking in part as uh, someone who was ambassador out there, <clears throat> I think it reflects uh, on Mr. Maliki's part a laudable desire uh, for them uh, on their part to take over as much control and as much of the lead as possible. I think uh, I personally believe that the end of 2007 date is realistic, but I think we've got to stress that, that the, the operative word is the lead doesn't mean necessarily entire control. Uh, and complete control of these activities, and I think there'll still be a need for American uh, support of various kinds, whether it's intelligence or uh, logistics uh, or what have you. But uh, clearly, we want to see a shift of weight, and uh, I think that's the thrust of what he's saying. <coughs> I, I'm not sure I'd hold anybody too literally to a time estimate, whether it's six, seven, or, or 12 months, because uh, uh, even with the best of intentions, sometimes these things are, are a challenge to achieve. I guess the better way for me to ask you is, do you, do you feel that this is an achievable goal within 12 months? Because if, if we go back to operation together forward, they were supposed to send six brigades, only two showed up. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to discern what your analysis is as to the likelihood of being able to do that in any reasonable time. Well, maybe I'll a ask, my, <coughs> ask my colleagues, sure. they may have done some work on on trying to assess this capability. Sure, I think there are, there are, there are two different parts of this. One is, uh, as the ambassador says, the desire uh, on the part of the Iraqi government uh, to uh, have the ability to control operations and to control the armed forces and to employ those armed forces, which they have very clearly stated and they are, they are clearly moving in that direction. Uh, the other part of that is the military assessment of the capabilities of each of those divisions, the brigades and the battalions. Uh, what they are capable of, uh, of doing um, from a training standpoint, uh, from an equipping standpoint, and certainly from the, the standpoint of the leadership of those organizations. And I'm sure that that's where General Casey is talking about in that regard. The assessments that I have seen uh, throughout in terms of the training of the Iraqi armed forces uh, indicate that uh, that by the end of 2007 uh, that they will possess the military capability uh, to take the lead in 
um, uh, various parts of, of Iraq. That said, there are still issues with the Iraqi Armed Forces in terms of manning and some equipping issues that are associated uh, with, uh, with those brigades. Uh, let me move to Afghanistan. We'll be, in our meetings with uh, General Frankly, General Eikenberry, we got a pretty bleak assessment of the upcoming spring in terms of the likelihood, the belief of increased activity across border, uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda based. Uh, they were very concerned about the apparent lack of, well, let me rephrase it, about the North Waziristan agreement between the tribal area leaders and, and uh, President Musharraf just not working, to put it kindly. Uh, we met with President Musharraf. He, he, he said he recognized that, that he would attempt to work on it. But given his political circumstance there, coupled with really a lack of uh, of traditional influence in that region. I, I'm just curious what your assessment is of any way of his being able to effectively establish an interdiction program in that region. Well, it's, uh, f first of all, I'd like to say I think that President Musharraf is a very committed partner in the war on terror. And uh, the, if you look at the Pakistani record over the past several years, uh, they have uh, um, put a lot of Al-Qaeda and, and foreign fighters out of commission uh, during that period of time. So I have no doubt whatsoever about their commitment uh, to this war. Uh, with respect to uh, the... I don't mean to interrupt, but just for the record, I don't either. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm curious right. about a bill. But, but it's in that context that I, that, that, uh, I wanted to address your question, Congressman. But with respect to the border, I think we all recognize and we all would agree that the 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 question of a sanctuary for uh, the Taliban uh, in um, Afghanistan, uh, in Pakistan is problematic and it is a, s a subject that we discuss and is on our agenda with the government of Pakistan with great, great uh, regularity and more work uh, needs to be done on that. And I think there's a recognition that until, you know, unless and until something is done to more definitively address that question, it's, it's always going to be more of a challenge to address the security problems that arise in Afghanistan. But this is a problem that we're actively working, and perhaps in closed session we can address uh, the question a little bit more with you, if this is something you want. Very good. Thank you. Uh, oh, General Hayden, did you have a comment? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. I think we can add a lot more in closed session. Uh, okay. I appreciate it. Good. Thank you, General. Ms. Isham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me um, uh, begin by congratulating you on your chairmanship. Um, and uh, I think the really outstanding comments that you made um, in your opening statement today, we all look forward to working with you and, uh, uh, and to seeing um, you succeed um, in your leadership of the committee. And to everyone that's here today uh, testifying, it's, uh, it's good to see you and uh, blessings in the new year for each one of you and for our country. Um, as um, uh, Congressman Hastings says, very little time, many questions. Uh, I want to get to something that has been of concern to me and other members of the committee over the last uh, uh, year and a half or so, uh, and that is the uh, uh, the issue of the issue of FISA. Uh, I uh, myself thought that it was uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, turnaround on the part of the administration uh, with the announcement of the uh, Attorney General to say essentially that um, uh, we've changed our minds. Um, so as, uh, as someone said, um, the administration was against it before they were for it. So uh, that's, a, that's it's, uh, I welcome the change as the, as the chairman noted in his opening comments. Uh, but to, to uh, Director Negroponte, uh, since we do have jurisdiction in this area, uh, what I'd like to ask you is, will the administration provide this committee with copies uh, of the FISA court orders uh, approved uh, last week? That's my first question. And my second question is, can you assure the, uh, this committee that all electronic surveillance of Americans is being conducted under the applicable uh, statutes uh, passed by Congress and not pursuant to a claimed inherent uh, presidential uh, war power? Um, I, I don't know. Subject to uh, advice from my counsel, I just don't know the answer to your first question about the, the court document. I, but uh, I, I can. Will you get that information yes, back I to the committee? Will. I certainly will. Please. Mm -hmm. um, 
with regard to your second question, and, and perhaps I could just back up uh, here a bit, uh, uh, Congresswoman Eshoo. I, this is a really vital program to the national security of the United States, and uh, I've always felt that, and I think it's been a, a, a really instrumental, a really useful tool in our war on terror, very important. And the discussion of whether to bring uh, uh, this matter and try to work something out with the FISA court is uh, something that predated uh, the public revelations of the program in December of uh, 2005. In fact, as far back as uh, uh, the spring of 2005, uh, some tentative discussions had been held with the FISA court because there's always been a feeling that if one could avail oneself of the FISA statute that we ought to uh, uh, look at those opportunities. But one thing the intelligence community always insisted on, and maybe that's one of the reasons it's taken the time it has to work something out, to bring the program that the President described to the American public uh, under a FISA court order, was our insistence, the intelligence community's assistance, insistence that whatever is done, the program, that nothing should be done to impede the, the speed, the agility, and the sources and methods of this program. And that was absolutely So what is your answer crucial. to my second question? <clears throat> as far as the program that was described to you uh, by the President of the United States, uh, that is um, uh, all comes under this uh, FISA order. That's so my all, answer to that but, question. Uh, but I, I'm being very specific, and I, maybe you don't want to answer the question. Perhaps it's something that should be brought up in, uh, in closed session. My, my question is about all electronic surveillance. Um, uh, that's being conducted, it, it, are they, is it being conducted under the applicable statutes and not <coughs> under uh, the previous um, uh, stand of, uh, uh, of the administrations of claimed uh, inherent presidential war power? There is a difference. I, I, I th the short answer is yes. I mean, if you're referring to uh, the program uh, that we have, have described to you, I, you know, I, you're asking me... <coughs> I'm not aware of any other. And I, I, I can offer that, and as we've said in, in several sessions with the committee, the NSA conducted its electronic surveillance under three authorities, uh, Executive Order 12333, uh, any authority granted to it by the FISA court, and then for the life of this program, uh, the, the authorities granted to the agency under the administration's program was being operated outside of FISA. So and it was being oper uh, uh, operated outside of FISA because of the claimed inherent uh, presidential war power. Well, I'm just and trying. so now that it's gone back to FISA, uh, the announcement of the Attorney General, I I'd like to know what, uh, under what, uh, under what circumstances. Well, as I was trying to say, he had the three authorities. The President has indicated he will not extend the presidential authorization. And everything NSA has been doing has been under one authority or another. With the President's decision not to extend the authorization, all the activity of the National Security Agency will be conducted under its authorities from Executive Order 12333 or uh, from FISA court warrants. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think your uh, comments in your uh, opening statement still apply. It, it is an area of, um, uh, I think it still is an area of concern, and, uh, and obviously I think that the committee is going to have to follow up with uh, the appropriate oversight. Thank you. But, Thank you. But I, Thank you. Uh, on, your, on your other question about the orders being made available, we're, we're looking into that to see if the orders can be made available. There's a separation of powers issue here. Okay. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. Uh, there's a 15-minute vote on. We've got about a uh, little under 10 minutes. I think we've got time to get uh, uh, Mr. Rogers' questions in. So we Thank recognize. you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for being here. Uh, uh, quickly. Uh, Director Negropani, I was a little concerned about uh, almost a sense, a lack of sense of urgency on, on NIEs. We use those as policymakers. Uh, this country is at war. We haven't had an NIE for Iran in over a year. We certainly haven't had any good look at an NIE for Iraq. Uh, I'm not sure how we don't think that's a bit of a failure on the new organization of the DNI to provide policymakers with relevant, prompt, and accurate information on which we can base decisions. Uh, 
Well, yeah, welcome to the committee, and good, good luck in the new job. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, I don't know if you can help us out on that. Is there any plan to, to give us prompt NIEs uh, on issues of interest? Well, I, I'd be uh, happy to uh, send you uh, under separate cover uh, just the workload, the, the, the very substantial uh, record of accomplishment of the National Intelligence Council and the National Intelligence Officers. It's, this is not a large body of people. There are less than 100 analysts that cover the entire world. Of course, they work and coordinate with the rest of the community. I think they have a very good record. Secondly, um, as I said earlier, uh, in addition to preparing these formal NIEs, we've been doing an awful lot of other work, uh, analytic work on Iraq, and including, I might say, in the past two months uh, when the President was developing the, this new approach to Iraq, the intelligence community was uh, was completely embedded in that process. We were in all the working groups uh, and so forth. So, uh, I, I think we've been, we've played our role, and I, I think we've uh, we've uh, uh, acquitted ourselves well in that task. And I, I happen to agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I do believe that that we ought to have uh, more timely and accurate, and I use, just in the sense that we've got some serious decisions to make here as well. Right. Uh, and committees is not the way, probably, to, for us to process that information best. Secondly, on the North uh, Waziristan agreement, uh, I, I see that as a fundamental failure for our national security interests. It just didn't work. I happened to be there at the time they were thinking the deal. Uh, there was a lot of promise for it. I at least had some hope for it myself. It's not working. And I think it's working to the uh, to, to probably our detriment. Uh, and I have not seen, or at least uh, from my perspective, a lot of pressure being placed on Pakistan to at least get some reversal, at least get troops back into North Waziristan, Pakistani <laughs> troops. Um, and I understand there's some political problems, but what are the efforts to correct the North Waziristan agreement uh, and the trouble I believe it's causing for safe haven in that area for uh, Al Qaeda and other terrorist leaders? <laughs> What I would say to that is that uh, the issue is front and center. It's, it's, it's one of these issues that's right on the front burner, as far as we're concerned, in terms of uh, security preoccupations uh, on the uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan border. It's a, sub a subject that we discuss uh, frequently in our dialogue uh, with the, the government of Pakistan. And as I indicated earlier, I think in closed session, I'd be willing to talk to you a little bit further about some of the things we're undertaking. Well, I'll look forward to better dialogue under a closed session. Uh, right, we had uh, the, the sectarian violence, we certainly know by the Zawahiri uh, Zarqawi letter was initiated by Al Qaeda. It was certainly in their planning phase. I mean, it, to me, it seems like it went exactly as planned, initiated by Al Qaeda, nourished by Iran, and now is self sustaining. Would you agree that it has now reached the level that it is self sustaining? It doesn't need Al Qaeda. Uh, action in order to continue sectarian violence that's occurring in Baghdad today? Well, that's a tough question to answer because I think that the, it's so clear, and we even see today when uh, in the recent incidents in, uh, in Baghdad, we see al indications of al direct al-Qaeda involvement in precipitating these incidents, uh, in bringing in the suicide bombers, uh, in uh, directing these attacks, which are clearly intended to aggravate whatever underlying sectarian tensions might exist in that country. So it's a little hard to disentangle uh, these things, and uh, uh, it's sure a problem we would like to have, i.e., if, if the al-Qaeda could be cut off uh, from this conflict and could be eliminated as a factor, I think that would, would be helpful. Uh, to stabilizing the situation. And I, just lastly and quickly, Maliki has said publicly before that he did not believe the Shia militias, which is a part of the problem of violence and sectarian violence uh, in Baghdad, he did not believe that we should engage them militarily. And said that fairly recently. What, what has changed? Has his position changed is according to the intelligence community? And does he <coughs> honestly and truly believe that a military action <coughs> is now the course of action with Shia militias? Uh, in in uh, under the Maktar army, the Al Sadr. But I think he's he's uh, the way he's articulated it publicly is talking about their commitment to going after criminal uh, and uh, criminal elements and people who are not uh, carrying uh, weapons in an authorized uh, manner. I do believe that uh, we're seeing indications that he is moving more to the, towards the position 
that sooner or later they're going to have to do something about the uh, most extremist elements. Uh, so on just the for the, side. I, the intelligence community's perspective, then, is that he is moving that way. He has not come to that conclusion as of yet. No, it's finished. That'd be my best shot at it. Yes, sir. I don't know if others. Would I, I, I would say that he is uh, he is supporting activities that are going on uh, uh, against uh, Jay Shaw Mahdi uh, currently. So I would take it a step further. You would, in, you I, take I would take a step, a step further so you that, say that he's not he's just thinking about it, that, that, that in fact uh, the, uh, the Iraqi government and armed forces are, are taking uh, actions against Jay Shalmati. They're engaging the militia as a strategy or as a piecemeal event by intelligence gathered and targeting pack. That's probably something we ought to talk about. In the yes, okay, thank you. Uh, at this juncture, it doesn't look like anyone is left to uh, ask any other questions uh, because there are votes on the floor. We're going to recess, uh, take the votes, and then return to you. Thank you. Three minutes left. Okay. Yeah, well, that's okay, good. That's good. helpful, actually.